have the pleasure of, of introducing our next, uh, our first session here for today. Um, Dawn Sands is going to be our, our moderator, a, a friend of mine and a pro that many of you will know. Uh, Dawn has nine years of executive management experience specializing in the community economic development sector. They're originally from Nipigon, Ontario, completed their education in social work and human resource management at Confederation College of Applied Arts and Technology in Thunder Bay, Ontario. Dawn has extensive experience leading nonprofit organizations that focus on project management, building effective networks, and administrating government funds. A skillful facilitator and participant with multi-stakeholder boards and committees, focusing on strategic planning and social innovation projects that build communities in a sustainable way. As an Indigenous woman, Dawn values collaboration and is passionate about community building by fostering respectful relationships and utilizing grassroots community-led development principles. Her experience have taught her that this approach is fundamental to the success of community building. So thank you very much, Dawn, for taking on the role of, of moderating this conversation we're having this morning. We'll get you spotlighted up here, we'll get you going, and then I will get out of the way. Hi, Dawn. And I'll uh, you unmuted it too. That's a key part. Didn't really set you up for success there. Uh, good morning, Anin, Tanse, Boju. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this morning's session. And thank you for that lovely introduction, Darcy. Uh, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge the beautiful smudge and prayer from Jolene this morning. It certainly is, is a beautiful way for us to be able to start our day um, and our morning here together. So this morning's session is focused on resources for community building, uh, trends in fun funding and financing. So we know over the last couple of years, um, our sector has experienced some, some interesting um, shifts in how funders are interacting with us. And then, you know, you throw a global pandemic on top of that and it creates some really um, interesting, challenging scenarios for us to be able to, to do the work that, that we come together to do. Um, so we thought we'd pull together um, a diverse panel for you here this morning to discuss some of these challenges and issues and successes that we've had along the way um, and hopefully learn from each other. So I want to start, I'm going to go through and I'm going to introduce everybody at first and then we'll just dive right in. So the first person, first panelist I want to introduce is Michael Redhead Champagne. I know many of you are familiar with, with Michael. Um, Michael is here uh, on behalf of Fearless R2W, but I also want to acknowledge that Michael is also um, on, on NERC's board of directors. So I get to work with Michael quite closely. I, I'm blessed in that sense. So Michael was born and raised in Winnipeg's North End. He is an award-winning community organizer, public speaker, and proud member of Shimadawa First Nation. Michael believes we all have a gift and shows youth the path to discover their own. He is solutions-oriented and passionate about building systems, literacy, encouraging volunteerism, and engaging communities to be involved in the design, delivery, and evaluation of any initiative that affects them. Michael, can you give everybody a wave? What's up, everybody? Um, so next, I have the pleasure of introducing Kim Hicks. Kim Hicks is also a colleague of mine from the time I spent in Thompson. So I'm really excited to have her here today to talk about all the good work that's happening up, up in Thompson, Manitoba, and to have a Northern rep on the panel. So Kim Hicks was raised in Churchill, Manitoba, a remote, tender barren community of 800 people. In this environment, she learned what it meant to be part of a community. In order to survive, it was necessary to help each other, rely on your neighbors, and to be creative with limited resources. She has carried forward these values in her work as the executive director positions she has held at the Riverside Daycare, Boys and Girls Club of Thompson, the Thompson Crisis Center, and most recently, the Thompson YWCA. She has deep-seated roots and relationships throughout the North, which has guided her success. Kim, can you give everybody a big wave? Good morning, everyone. Um, and our third panelist here today, uh, Glenn from Manitoba Eco Network, um, is, a, is, a, is a new colleague of mine. So I'm really excited to get to work with Glenn and get to know him a little bit better. Uh, Glenn Coraluck has spent most of his working career in the nonprofit sector and charitable sector as a community organizer and coordinator on issues and projects such as housing, food, sovereignty, community development, and environmental protection. He is currently the executive director of the Manitoba Eco Network and volunteers as a board member with the National Farmers Foundation, the Canadian Environmental Network, 
and his local community club, Valor CC. Welcome, Glenn. Can you say hi to everybody this morning? Hey, hi. Glad to be here. Awesome. Yeah, I'm excited for the conversation this morning. I know Darcy talked a little bit about how unfortunate it is we all can't be together in person, like how much, you know, that the gathering and for us to come together is so special for us. And that is so true. Um, but a bit of a silver lining, I think, with all of this is, um, you know, this morning, I really feel like I just get to hang out my living room and, and have coffee and a conversation with my friends. So um, there is a there is a level of comfort of, of, of the Zoom, so I just have to say that. So, um, so yeah, let's dive in. Um, so the first question I have is, I re we really just want to get an understanding of um, who's currently supporting the work you do and how that relationship is working. So maybe Kim, I'll start with you and talk a little bit about who your current sources of funding are and, um, and just a little bit of details about that, if you don't mind. Okay, so we don't have a whole lot of funding. <laughs> uh, we uh, have some provincial support for our employment programs. So in our Steps to Success and our assessment programs, that is our only provincially funded um, program at the Y. Um, we are obviously during COVID doing some COVID response projects. We have four projects um, responding to COVID, um, particularly in the homeless population. Um, and those have been primarily supported um, by federal funding. Um, and then our other activities, our women's center, our medical boarding, you know, those types of things, um, our transition program are all self-funded um, through our business. Um, so yeah, so we have very limited provincial funding and, and really don't have a whole lot of access to um, other funding particular, well, this is probably a different question. So if I jump ahead, uh, I'm gonna shut up. I think it's further on, I'll talk about that, but that is our primary funding structure really where we self fund through our uh, business, um, which is struggling because um, of COVID, particularly uh, there's not a whole lot of travel in Northern Manitoba. Uh, in terms of medical, so it's really just people that um, you know are requiring services when they're pregnant or cancer patients and diabetes. Um, but we had a 75% loss in clientele actually staying at the Y, uh, which is <laughs> which is a you know a breaking point for us because that money pays for all our services that we provide in Thompson outside of the employment programs. Is that? Don? Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Thanks, Kim. Um, Michael, so the question to you, so Fearless R2W is a relatively new organization. You guys are just in your startup phase. So can you talk a little bit about um, what that looks like for, for Fearless? Yeah, uh, this is Sushi, just in case anyone's wondering who keeps walking back and forth here. Um, but uh, basically with Fearless R2W, um, we actually began as a grassroots group in 2014, and our work, um, our work predates our legal entity status. And I think therein lies my big secret um, that I, I bring to the table here today, and that's doing a bunch of work before you get funding to do it, um, which I know is a privilege if you have the time, ability, and capacity um, to do. Um, but also recognizing that uh, there's urgency in our community that sometimes doesn't let us wait for funders um, and all of their hoops that we need to jump through um, before we deliver a service that sometimes will be life-saving, that can support a family, a young person aging out of care, or uh, somebody who's you know ready to, to take steps today to help themselves or their families, but the broader systems don't always help that. So um, for us uh, at Fearless R2W, we look at our funders as partners instead of as um, uh, like they hold all the power and we do the dance. Um, and so we have uh, a number of partners uh, that I guess would be technically considered funders, um, but we don't call them funders. We don't consider them funders. We call them partners because we consider ourselves um, to be on equal footing with them. And so we have just as much of a say in what we do as they do, because we have the expertise on the ground about what needs to happen for our families. And the funders, while well-intended, have the capacity to make it so, we need to explain to them how. 
So for us, we have uh, a perspective where we work uh, very, very closely with all of our funders um, before they give us money for many years. Um, and then when it comes to the point where they actually want to give us money, we already know everything, like the broader context, how they work, what they like, what they don't like, and we can hit the ground running. Um, so that's our strategy. So Michael, can you tell us a little bit about who's currently funding your work? Like who's part of your startup? Sure. Um, we have uh, a partnership with uh, Mama Wichita McDonald Youth Services, and we have funding in that partnership from the province, but it lives over at Mama Wichita Center. We have a partnership with North End Renewal Corporation um, to do some housing advocacy, but that lives at North End Renewal Corporation. Um, we are moving into uh, becoming our own legal entity, and so we have some funding um, and partnerships with universities doing community-based research um, to support our system navigation work. And so that's with the Network Environment for Indigenous Health Research. And so we're going to be training folks on how to engage in uh, measurement, uh, measuring strong families, measuring success um, from our perspective as families in the North End. So there's a couple. Thank you, Michael. And Glenn, you, you bring a real interesting perspective to the table here today because I think Kim and Michael deal in a lot of frontline service work, um, but the work that happens through the Manitoba Eco Network System um, would be, cons in my opinion, considered like long-term sustainability and equally important. Um, so what does this look like for you, Glenn, right now um, when everything is so frontline services? Can you tell us a little bit about what your current funding relationships are in that context? Yes, um, I've been uh, the ED here now for almost two years. So we, we've gone through uh, uh, the organization has been around for over 30 years. So it's had its ups and downs. We've, we're going through a major transition right now. We've got a, 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 a new board, volunteer board, very enthusiastic. And uh, one of the first things we did is we got a uh, organizational grant from the Winnipeg Foundation and put together like a strategic plan, a three year strategic plan and um, prior uh, to me starting, uh, the organization was heavily dependent on provincial funding and there was a core agreement uh, in place that it was you know, four years in, in length and there were many of those uh, over the years. So, uh, you know, we, we kind of moved to a, a strategy where we have to really diversify our money and, and uh, look for it in many different places. That core funding's not around anymore with the province. Uh, it's kind of uh, kind of like looking through uh, looking for change in your couch. <laughs> uh, you, you try to put all that money together from different places. So it's 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 challenging. Uh, we uh, we we don't do uh, community based uh, programs anymore. That's another change that uh, that happened to the organization. We we're getting more into policy advocacy and uh, trying to develop uh, capacity for, for environmental groups. So it's, it's harder to find that kind of funding. So in the last year, we've been really dependent on, on you know, funding from the Winnipeg Foundation. Uh, there's internship programs that we're using for, for labor costs, uh, Eco Canada, uh, and then some of the student programs out there that the province put out and the federal government. Um, we, we're uh, we're doing more on the ask for for donations, so private donations. Uh, Giving Tuesday was yesterday, so 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 we're we're, we're building that uh, that sort of part of our our fundraising. Uh, we have a social enterprise. We run the uh, the eco center. Uh, we we lose money running uh, running it, so <laughs> maybe not a good example. Um, and. Uh, and you know, smaller foundations like ACU has been always good to us. Uh, uh, all charities campaign that fluctuates from year to year, but government employees, uh, you know, donate to us. And uh, we have a we all we also have a trust fund set up through the through the Winnipeg Foundation. It doesn't have a lot of money in it, but uh, it, it gives a return of uh, money every year. So it's it's little bits and pieces right now for for us. Thanks, Glenn. So you raised a couple of interesting points that I think. Um, I'd like to expand on a little bit. So when you talked about um, that you, you run a social enterprise, um, I know Fearless R2W has also talked about running a social enterprise. And Kim, you talk about running um, a business um, with a social purpose. So very, right, so it all, for all intents and purposes, you could be considered a social enterprise. 
Um, I think we're seeing a real movement towards this in, in our sector. So can you talk to a little bit about how, what your social enterprise is and, and how you arrived at making a decision to launch one? Okay, well, that, that decision, uh, ba basically the social enterprise is, is managing the eco center. So uh, we, we rent uh, 4,500 square feet of space uh, above the Manitoba uh, Equipment Co-op. And, and there are uh, like five other organizations that rent through us, so they're, they sub sublease. So, so we're the managers of the eco center. So that's, that's our social enterprise. Uh, that decision was made, you know, back in 2003, where, where you know, there was a desire to get uh, environmental organizations housed in, uh, in one place. It, it's, 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 you know, it, it was a good decision and it's, it's a valuable place because not only do the groups who uh, rent space at the Eco Center uh, benefit, uh, you know, other organizations, environmental organizations that use the space. So it's kind of a in environmental hub, but you, you know, we're we're just breaking even on that. So it's it wasn't never intended to uh, to make money. So so that was the social enterprise. I interesting enough, uh, we were approached uh, this past year to to put in an application to the IRP, the Investment Readiness Program, to to do a feasibility study to to get into a true uh, social enterprise, uh, we didn't get the, uh, the the application wasn't successful. So, so it's 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 in our, our back of our minds for our board that that's, uh, you know maybe doing a social enterprise is, a, is another way to do something that benefits the community but also brings in uh, money. Thanks, Glenn. Um, Kim, I'm going to come back to you for a minute. Can you tell me a little bit about um, the WISE? I'm going to call it a social enterprise because I think it's, it's a good fit for what you guys do. Um, tell us a little bit about that model and um, has it evolved um, over the years for you? Because I know it's been around for a long, long time. Yeah, so yes, it is a social enterprise because primarily <laughs> everything, the reason we run that business is so that we can run programs for the, for the region, for the um, city of Thompson and, and of course the region. Um, definitely it's evolved over time. Uh, it originally just started as uh, women and children, uh, kind of a medical boarding facility. So primarily women that were coming in to, you know, um, have their babies or uh, needs that they required for their children. Um, because as I think everybody's aware, um, Thompson would be the hub for medical uh, for the Northern region. So a lot of um, the surrounding area come in for medical. Um, they were not able to actually sustain themselves just with uh, women and children. Um, and not, although we're a women's organization, there was a decision made uh, in the 80s actually to start accepting uh, men as well uh, into our boarding facility. Um, so that kind of took the Y to a different level and they were able to um, you know, sustain themselves uh, after adding men uh, at the point they were ready to actually shut down because they just couldn't sustain the business. Um, and we've evolved obviously over the years, depending on what the circumstances are. Uh, definitely when we look at COVID, uh, we obviously went to the table as a, as a social enterprise and said, you know, we have the ability um, to, for the province to rent rooms, for the health authority to rent rooms for whatever need they, you know, they have in the North. Um, and so, we're forever trying to be at the table to try to diversify what type of service we're providing so that we're able to keep our facility full so that we're able to continue to offer our programs. So we have 60 rooms uh, in our building. Uh, on our last count, we had 96 clients on site um, and that's within um, five programs, three of which are COVID related. So that's kind of really on a positive COVID note, that's kind of, really uh, carried the why and enabled us to be able to stay open through the entire pandemic um, because those rooms provide us the money we require to continue to operate. So, and I'm a little scattered because I've been here since five this morning. So if I miss something, Don, you know me, you can just prompt me to say something different. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, um, Kim, forgive me for sharing this, but I, I don't think a lot of people know this, and I think it's really interesting when we talk about, um, you know, our commitments to our organization. So, um, Kim actually sheltered in place for two weeks, quarantined um, at the Y, um, I guess a couple of weeks ago. Are, are you out of quarantine now, Kim? Just 
Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not a quarantine, but there's always a risk that I'll need to quarantine again, obviously, with 96 people in the building. Uh, we're doing three different types of isolation projects. So we do one uh, harm reduction isolation project uh, for vulnerable people that require um, support with their addictions. We do an isolation project for vulnerable people that don't require support for addictions. Uh, we do a homeless uh, COVID response project for 25 of the highest risk homeless. Uh, and then most recently entered into a partnership with surrounding um, communities to provide uh, community isolation um, because many of the communities have their own mandated isolations uh, that they require their membership to complete prior to returning home. Um, so the risk of having to quarantine uh, definitely exists every day for me. Uh, every time every time we have a positive case, I kind of hold my breath. Um, basically, the reason for quarantining was, or for the choice to quarantine on site was that we recognize that um, obviously when we have a COVID outbreak, uh, the majority of the staff are put into isolation off site. And we didn't have the ability or we don't have the capacity in the north to be placing, you know, 25 to 30 people because um, staffing has gone into isolation. Um, and so the decision was extremely easy when the medical officer of health actually phoned to tell me, you know, unfortunately, you need to isolate Kim as well. And I said, well, I'd like special permission to isolate on site. Um, I said, because I really don't know where we're going to put 30, you know, 32 homeless people. Um, in Thompson, which was already uh, full because we were seeing um, some rising numbers and continue to see rising numbers. So, Yeah, and I think that is, and I, I, sh I wanted to share this because I think it's an incredible example of the level of creativity um, that is required when, when you're providing essential services in the North, right? That you said like there just isn't, an, you know, that, that a pool of people to draw from to, re to replace or to fill in. So it's, um, and it's commendable, honestly, as well. So um, thank you for doing that. So Michael, I'm gonna to turn to you um, because, because Fearless RTW is new um, and you guys are actually looking at um, a social enterprise as part of your, your operations right from day one. It's not something that you're figuring out afterwards. So, so tell us a little bit about um, the social enterprise that you're looking at starting and again, why, why you're choosing to go that route. You're, you're muted. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me now? You're good. Great. Um, so for us at Fearless R2W, uh, we do child welfare education and advocacy. So for everyone here who really loves child and family services, you will know uh, it is a multifaceted beast. And so the parents that we work with and the young people who have aged out of CFS have told us that um, not only is the actual um, kind of aging out of CFS or getting away from being in CFS uh, a difficult process. Um, part of what makes it so difficult is that you, if you don't have the financial means to care for yourself, you will never be able to truly be independent from the system. And so I know too many kids that at the age of 18 um, get directly transferred from being in child welfare to being in EIA, Employment Income Assistance, um, with very little life skills development, with very little opportunity for these young people to um, be lifted out of uh, future poverty. And so that's really what uh, we've uh, decided as Fearless R2W. We've identified a number of areas where families, uh, families have identified for us some pinch points in the systems that uh, are constant sources of difficulty for families that are de dealing with child welfare. That's respite that's uh, security guards, and that's secretaries. So if you have any of these things in your organizations, guess what? My families have negative experience with them all the time. And we are working now to develop um, an alternative where we will pay our families to do those jobs instead. I would much rather pay somebody with lived experience from my community to be an auntie standing at the front of a building. It makes me feel safer than if it's some random security guard that we hire from outside of the neighborhood who comes in and is afraid of everyone because they're a security guard. Um, there's this weird power imbalance. But if I hire an auntie who knows everyone, someone comes in and starts acting up, guess what auntie's gonna say? Beat it. 
And that is what we need. That to me is safety. And so it's family-based, it's culturally safe, it's trauma-informed, it's harm reduction oriented, um, but it's also employment generating so that families can have independence. And so it's not enough to simply provide that social component anymore. I feel like uh, me and many of you in this call have for years been raging against the charity model and saying, don't treat me like no charity case. You ain't my white horse coming to save me. I'm not your damsel in distress. If you really want to help me, uh, teach me something. Um, if, if you really want to help me, give me employment opportunities, give me education opportunities so that I can support myself or my family um, and I don't have to forever be reliant upon this nonprofit or this charity or this group. Um, I can take care of my family myself. So that's our perspective as we build Fearless R2W um, and incorporate this social enterprise component. <laughs> I can see people cheering. <laughs> yeah, when we talk about, you know, developing services and programs and opportunities that are community-based and relationship-based, um, like we know, right, that is the heart of our communities. And we know that there is great success when, when we follow that model. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about um, so now we talked about the heart of the work. Can you talk a little bit about the technical piece of the work? So the startup of the social enterprise, who's going to be your partner in this and how is that going to work? Uh, well, we don't have a lot of experience ourselves in doing this kind of stuff. And so, like I said before, when you don't know what to do, you partner. Um, and so for us, we've uh, partnered with North End Community Renewal Corporation, um, among others, uh, to follow up on something that we did recently. So we did this thing. Okay, I'm sure everybody here knows how frustrating it is to have to bend your programming into something new every time a different funder comes along and is like, oh, we don't fund old programs, we only fund new programs. So then everyone's like, oh, I have a new name for this old program. And you like try to make it pretend like it's a new thing. So we just did that um, with the national housing strategy, getting some federal innovation dollars. Now, here's a funny thing. Why would the federal... Why would the national housing strategy help people build housing? It didn't. We just studied. We just studied how to build housing. Anyway, moral of the story is we're now taking that study and we're moving forward with partners like North End Renewal Corporation to address the social enterprise component because we recognize that we want to be able to generate um, income for our families. We don't always want to be going around saying, please give me money. Um, we want our families to be empowered. And if we include them in every element of our organization, um, like in a truly equitable way, we don't want to re-traumatize families that like from a service level have to go around and say, please help me all day long. And then when they come onto our boards or whatever, then they have to go to funders and say, please help me all day long. No, um, we believe in strength. Um, and so I believe that we have enough skills and capacity in our communities and in our families um, that we can offer supports and skills um, that other people can pay for. And if we look at the pinch points, that's what I called them earlier, we look at the pinch points that offer such discomfort in the lives of the people that we serve, I think we see uh, the, the entryway for where many of us nonprofit types can get into um, social enterprise so that we can start generating income for that financial independence for the people we serve. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Glenn, I want to circle back to you because you mentioned that you are receiving a trust through, did you see the Winnipeg Foundation? And I think this is a relatively new model. Can you, can you talk about um, how that works and, and, and what that, so basically how it works and, and what it's going to support? Sure. <clears throat> the, uh, it's an endowment fund. So uh, anyone could donate, uh, uh, put money into it. And it just sits and collects uh, interest. So it's it's a, it's a trust fund. Uh, it's in partnership with the Winnipeg Foundation. Uh, Winnipeg Foundation has partnered with many uh, charitable organizations in the province to set up these trust funds. Um, the, the interesting thing is that uh, the province is now looking at uh, trust funds as a way to uh, fund uh, organizations in the environmental sector. Um, you know, recently there was a, you know, a, an announcement that the Fort White Nature Center got $4 million that, uh, that was placed in their trust fund at the Winnipeg Foundation. And uh, they're, they're going to sort of, the organization's going to live off the, the interest on a yearly basis. Uh, so, so 
Fort White, uh, Trails Manitoba, Oak Hammock Marsh. These are all recent announcements uh, by, by the current government. Um, and the big one was a couple of years ago where a conservation trust was, was set up with the Winnipeg Foundation and, and $100 million was put into that by the province. So that's managed by the Manita Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation. So it generates maybe $5 million a year and that money goes out uh, to, to stewardship organizations and watershed organizations and conservation groups on a yearly basis basis. So, so that's, that's kind of the trend uh, um, we're seeing in the environmental sector. Um, I, I mean, that, that could be duplicated with many different sectors. Uh, you know, for our organization, you know, we're focused more on policy advocacy. So, so, so we're not one of those organizations that, that would qualify for, for something like that with, the, with a partnership with the province. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's an interesting trend. Um, is it good? Is it bad? We don't know yet. <laughs> For me, I, I think it's uh, a bit of uh, privatizing uh, government services, you know, and especially when we talk about uh, the environment and protecting the environment. It's, it's really important to have governments at the forefront uh, doing that kind of work. So, so, um, so, so that, that, that would be one danger to, to look at, you know, the, the, the capital is in private hands. Uh, the board uh, that uh, decides how the money goes, it's a politically appointed board. So, so we're, we're, you know, we're seeing more of a politicization of, of uh, how money is doled out in the environmental community. Um, also, um, you know, now this, this government's looking at bonds. Uh, they announced uh, a recent green bond that they want to develop for, for organics and composting. So that's that's kind of a trend that we're seeing right now. Thank you, Glenn. So so the next question I have, this is this is our dream. This is this is if if we could just um, design a funding relationship or a funding model um, to meet all of your organization's needs, what do, what would that look like? And Glenn, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with you since you're already on the screen. Give me your dream funding scenario. Okay. Well, so so that's 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 difficult because you know the the work we do is is different from from other uh, organizations in in the environmental uh, sector. So it varies for, for us. Um, uh, you know, we're not going to get core funding with with the current provincial government, and, and that's fine. But um, it, it, it's good to have sort of longer term funding available, like three year projects. Uh, the federal government is 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 doing that with its climate awareness fund. So, so you could do a bit better planning and and build better partnerships. So, so if the, the province could do more of that on a project by project basis, that would be great. Um, and um, yeah, another example uh, is, is from the past. Uh, we're a provincial affiliate of the Canadian Environmental Network. And the Canadian Environmental Network uh, was, was a fairly large organization uh, 15 years ago. They, ha they had a contractual agreement with the federal government to, to do advocacy you know to do consultation uh, they, they would get the grassroots environmental organizations across the country together and, and discuss policy and, and discuss the issues and and the federal government of the day you know uh, appreciated that kind of relationship so so I think that's important and, and I'd like to see that kind of uh, a funding a re relationship uh, with, with other levels of government, you know, the city and the province uh, here, uh, because it's important for, for everyone to engage in the, in the legislative process. It's important to, to attend consultation exercises and, and develop uh, a policy that we, we view as being important for our communities. Thank you, Glenn. So Kim, same question to you. If you could draft your, your dream funding relationship, what would that look like? draft and get it approved. <laughs> Actually, you're muted.
Oh, you're still muted. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I was just going to say, I'd go back to what Michael said in his first question. Really, in my experience, um, particularly when we're talking about actual program um, fun funding and delivery, is uh, we have difficulties securing it just based on our model of how we deliver programming. And obviously, governments are very, uh, I noticed in the chat, they're talking about the imbalance and kind of the disconnect between, you know, frontline service providing services compared to what they're asking for in, a, in an application, for an example. And I'll use one program that, you know, was funded uh, a few years ago at the Y, uh, which was a woman's um, kind of support group. Um, but their kind of parameters around how it should be delivered is really heavily based on statistics and not the reality of what we're seeing on the ground. So, you know, um, threatening to take funding away because not all 12 women attended 12 sessions, you know, very statistical base where, you know, for in the way the Y delivers the program is it's, it's, it's all individual client based and governments are very big on these groups and these sessions that take place over a amount of weeks. And really when people are in crisis and, and if you're dealing with vulnerable populations, they don't know from one day to the next where they're going to be and they can't commit to you know, a 12 week program. And so you run that risk of, of losing funding, uh, which we did um, because we couldn't deliver within those parameters of the government. And, you know, I noticed not to go off on another topic, but I noticed in the um, chat room too is, is definitely, you know, um, balancing between the social enterprise and funding and not having one or the other is probably the most successful model, but also advocating at a government level level to be more realistic in terms of funding um, programs and if we actually looked at best practices that they say in client service is these wraparound services at an individual client response um, so the why changed our model probably about four years ago or three years ago which was extremely risky because we haven't been able to secure funding ever since um, but you know it was about um, being more responsive to the clientele that we were serving as opposed to being dictated from a government how we were going to serve clients that they have no clue about. And no offense to any government officials on here. Please still fund me if I send my application in. So. <laughs> yeah, Kim, I think you raised a good point. And I know I'm supposed to be asking the questions here, but you know, I, I just have to speak a little bit from a NERC perspective. Um, so recently, or pre-COVID, I guess now, uh, NERC was a recipient from the United Way of, of a grant that was completely unrestricted. Um, they said, as long as it goes to, you know, safety and addictions, um, go ahead and spend it and um, just write us a report at the end and let us know what you did with the money. And um, when I got the news, I, I, I did, I cried because I'm just like, like, you mean like, like, where, like, where's, like, where's all my restrictions? <laughs> Like, where's my rules, <laughs> right? And they're like, and it just, the level of trust, right? The level of trust that that, init, that, that, that gained between our organizations and, and their faith in us to be able to do the work, um, you know, it really changes the tone of the relationship. And, and, and Michael talked about, you know, we're partners in this. We're, we're truly partners in this. So, you know, um, from, from our perspective, you know, for more unrestricted funding to be available and more of this, you know, mutually beneficial, respectful relationships, I think would definitely, definitely go a long way. And I want to say, you know, the ability to tell the story is so much more impactful than the number of people that have accessed that service. So if one person has an impactful change from a program that they've accessed in a, a social serving uh, agency, uh, as opposed to a government number of, oh, well, you serve 40 people, but maybe you didn't serve those 40 people where they needed to be served, right? Like, so it, it, it creates this, um, yeah, it's frustrating, definitely. And I won't go on to a, a, a huge round. My other frustration is that they don't, there's not a recognition of the, the relationship between economic development and social services and all of those need to work together in a puzzle um, because we'll never be successful. So we can't just focus on, which is frustrating in the North because a huge push in the North has been this economic development. But how do you develop economy if your people aren't safe and your people aren't protected and your people aren't provided what they need? But I'll end there because there's other people to talk and Michael's probably biting at the bit 
Michael and I will have to talk after offline. <laughs> We will, we will. There's so much, uh, there's so much that's happening here. Um, Don, I think my perfect funder, I want to pick on someone that I know was in the call um, because we've had a positive uh, experience uh, recently and it comes from an unlikely place. The good story that I want to tell you today is about the city of Winnipeg. All right, so I know Erin, I see her in the call and there maybe are other people from the city here too, but the city of Winnipeg recently put out their little crime prevention grants, right? So they sent it to 23 different organizations and they just did round two a little while ago. Fearless RTW applied for and successfully received one of those grants. Um, we wanted to do something in the end. Um, the something that we wanted to do was much, much more difficult and much more expensive than we thought when we applied. Then the pandemic hit. So now instead of doing the actual thing we were gonna do, we've been in communication with the folks at the city of Winnipeg it's only a $5,000 grant, not like this is huge money, um, but they've been very flexible uh, with us. And now we're um, connecting to 13 organizations that are already doing that work. And we're gonna be writing a, a report to support them. And so it becomes more of a support to the existing work in the community instead of us doing it. Um, but that's an adjustment that was made in recent months. And I appreciate the flexibility um, of the city of Winnipeg in that regard, because it allows us to meet the needs of the community as they're changing. And so I think that flexibility of funders to understand when things are changing in the community and uh, that agreement we signed like six months ago, eight months ago, one year ago, um, doesn't really mean anything anymore. Uh, things are different now. It's a new world out here. Um, and so I appreciate when funders are able to have that flexibility um, with us. So long as of course, um, you know, measurables and whatnot are, and objectives are still met. Um, that flexibility, I think, is key because it shows me that my funder trusts me to make decisions. And that trust is critical for the relationship. If I ask a funder, can I do this? And they say no every single time, that shows me that the funder doesn't trust me. So I don't, I'm probably not going to apply again because you don't trust me. And I don't like that. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. So I have one more question left and it's a COVID related question. I, I noticed I see some really good questions starting to pop up in the chat. Um, so I'll ask my last question and then um, I'll jump right into the, the Q&A if everyone's okay with that. So Michael, again, because you're in front of me, I'll start with you. Um, so COVID, right? We, we're in the middle of a pandemic and we know that we've had to make some shifts and changes to accommodate you know, our operations and, and our services in this moment. How do you foresee um, post COVID, is it, do you foresee any big changes um, or, or changes to your, your upstart in terms of how you're gonna offer programming afterwards? Yep, uh, COVID has changed the way that we deliver our services in two ways. One is everything we do now has a lens of public health on it, everything. Every single thing we do, when we're in, trying to increase visits, we talk to a public health nurse uh, and child welfare. When we have to go to a meeting with a social worker, we'll make sure we have information armed from a public health nurse. Um, so that public health component, um, I think is something we're just gonna keep forever because it's been very helpful in advocating for reunification because that parent-child contact um, is good for the health of the child and the parent. And so that's kind of our argument there. And then the other side of it, other than public health, is mental health. And so now because of COVID, everything is different. What day is it? Um, who am I? Do I still have a job? Um, you know, like these are pretty, these are pretty unfortunate situations that we all tend to ask ourselves every day. Um, and so that's not good for our mental health. And so I think we really have to be considerate of students, um, of people that are in the workplace and people working at home that um, there's a real mental health component we have to start uh, building into every single thing that we're doing. So when we're doing human resources in our workplaces, we better have good mental health plans for our staff. Okay, I'm on a thing with a bunch of executive directors here. If we have staff that we oversee, we better have self-care plans for those staff, alrighty? And I know that it's probably not in your job description, but it's COVID now, it's a pandemic. And if you really wanna take care of your staff, do it. Um, so I want to encourage everybody who oversees staff in a supervisory way to work with and develop self-care plans with all of your staff to make sure that um, 
we can action those self self care plans when a critical incident happens. So there's my rant. I don't even know if I answered the question. Sorry, Don. I think you did. I think you did. Uh, <laughs> Kim, um, how about you guys up north? How how is COVID going to impact, um, or will it impact how you guys offer your services post post pandemic? Most most definitely yes. Um, so COVID obviously, I mean, everywhere in the province has has had huge impacts. Uh, but when we look at the north in terms of, you know, transportation issues and accessing service um, from our northern region into a, you know, a hub city, um, definitely we'll see some significant changes. We've seen significant changes already, uh, even in the response of the, you know, the community itself um, to outerlying, you know, communities accessing service in in Thompson, you know, I think my biggest, you know, my biggest probably thing that keeps me up at night is how do we, how do we sustain our operations following COVID, particularly when it comes to having a social enterprise that is dependent on movement of people through the North. Um, so from a wide perspective, definitely, um, those are things that keep me up at night and trying to diversify in the middle of a pandemic with other social service or other agencies that require service uh, is difficult. Um, but then also on the delivery of service, because um, like Michael is saying, um, everything changes in even how we, how we can deliver service. Um, and so I'll echo kind of Michael's point of, you know, making sure that your staff are um, taken care of during a pandemic and feel safe and feel uh, you know, that they're okay and um, try to manage panic. Um, but it is, it is also, uh, we've been doing a hot, heck of a lot of work uh, with our clients um, that live in our building and our housing programs and our homeless clients that live here because the impact is so so much greater um, on the mental health than, than I think some of the focus sometimes is. And it's as simple as not even be able to apply for EIA or the frustrations on the delays. So COVID will change the way we do things. COVID will put at risk um, definitely um, social serving agencies in the North uh, mm -hmm. because of the way our systems work up here. Um, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out, so. Thanks, Kim. Um, Glenn, I'm interested to hear from you. Um, because you have an environmental mandate, um, and this is a global pandemic, right? So, so we know that this pandemic um, is a result of a global supply, uh, food supply chain and the World Health Organization is telling us that unless you know, we do something globally about, about this particular supply chain, we can expect more pandemics coming down the pipe. So through an environmental lens, I'm interested to hear how this will impact the work that you guys are doing moving forward. Not a simple question. <laughs> no. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the pandemic has been tragic. Um, it's it's impacted the environmental sector. I mean, it's impacted how organizations can uh, raise money. It's impacted how they could be advocates. Uh, I mean, we had youth uh, last year who got almost fifteen thousand people on the streets. Uh, protesting for for uh, for a better climate um you know global warming's not going away so um you know i i, I balance myself between being the optimistic pessimist or the pessimistic optimist so um you know they're they're I think there are really, really good lessons to learn from from this pandemic and, and how people can come together and, and work with, with each other to solve problems. And, and I hope that problem solving will continue because, you know, the, 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 the global warming issue is, is on the forefront of, uh, you know, what's facing humanity right now. Uh, we have like uh, 400, 15 parts per million uh, of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so it's 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 causing uh, climate change all over the, the, the globe so um so that's something we're, we're, we're going to have to work towards uh, in in the very near future 
Um, and uh, and I, I guess the message that some of the youth that I've been hearing is is that, yeah, I mean, we, we got to solve the pity issue. We got to solve the uh, you know the the income issue. We got to you know the disparity between the rich and, and the poor. But the youth are saying, well, if there's no planet that's habitable to live in, <laughs> all those other problems uh, you know don't really mean much. So. So um, my pessimistic side is, is saying right now, and I hate to close it off with that, but uh, our, our organization, you know, became a bit dependent on, on the programs that were out there currently. Uh, the federal government has, has done a, a really good job uh, in helping different sectors to cope with the, the pandemic. Uh, we had a bit of wage subsidy top-offs. Uh, we're exploring rent subsidies. Uh, you know, there's a provincial program to, to help employ people, so so that's good. Uh, I took a, a quick peek at the uh, the budget uh, that was uh, sort of the budget papers that were released by the federal government a couple of days ago, and and year two, the second year, the next fiscal year is I think is going to be a real challenge for the charitable and the, and the nonprofits sector because that government money at all levels of government is not going to be there like it was uh, this year. Thanks, Glenn. Um, so we have a question from Marianne. Glenn, Marianne wants you to talk a little bit about your fundraiser to get seniors to donate their rebate money to your group. Um, how much did that raise and what was the response from the province and the seniors? Oh, the Seniors for Sustainability campaign. Yes, that was a partnership uh, between our organization, uh, Climate Change Connection, and the Green Action Center. And basically, it was a campaign put together by uh, a consultant who uh, put the word out that if you don't need your $200 that was given to you uh, by the provincial government, uh, uh, consider... Uh, putting it towards these three organizations as a donation. Um, it, it was, it was a, a somewhat of a successful uh, campaign for us uh, uh, and the, the other two organizations. And um, yeah, we, we might uh, think of uh, redoing that again uh, next year too. How much money? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, for us it brought in like $15,000. Nice. Thanks, Glenn. Um, so we have one last question and I'm gonna ask um, both Kim and Michael um, to answer it. You guys can do popcorn to decide who goes first. Um, but this is a really good question. So I, I'm, I am mindful it is 10.01. Um, so if we can just keep our responses um, concise and then we'll be able to wrap up. So the question is, how might all of our organizations collaborate to nudge funding agencies towards real change? Michael, you go first. I'll go. I'll go first. Um, I think we can nudge our uh, funding agencies if every single one of us picks up the phone after this session today and calls one of our funders and explains the heart and soul of why we do our work to your main funding person, so that they understand on a heart level why your work is so important, so you can build a relationship with them. That's what we can all do. And if we all start um, ensuring that the funders know why we lose sleep at night, why are we losing sleep at night? They should be losing sleep at night too. Um, so I'm not saying make them lose sleep at night, but kind of. Kim? Yeah, why not make them lose sleep at night? That would be my first thing, very concise. Uh, and I also think strength in numbers. So me individually phoning uh, phoning uh, a funder of mine as opposed to maybe a collective phoning and saying, listen, uh, we need to change the way you fund Thompson or the way you fund Th um, social services in Thompson. So I've been doing lots of work kind of behind the scenes, even through the pandemic, um, talking with different social, other social serving agencies and saying, listen, we need, we need to really push, the, push this government to change the way they fund. So I'll keep it short because it's after 10. Bye. 
Wonderful. Well, I'm just going to wrap up by saying thank you so much to our panelists today. Um, it's been an honor to 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 share the virtual stage with you guys. Um, wow. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your heart and your gifts with us. I think we I think there's been lots of really good information shared here. Um, lots of good comments coming through the chat. So um, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. And I am now going to turn it back over to Darcy. Thank you very much, Don. Um, one thing we may offer is that if folks wish to continue having this conversation, uh, we can actually, and, and want to keep learning more on this exact topic, we can actually throw you all out into a breakout room. Um, we're going to be switching to some music programming now, but if you are able and interested in continuing this conversation, because it seems like it, it's quite lively, um, just rename yourself um, your Zoom name, put an A in front of your name, which will throw you up to the top of our list and make it clear for us who's interested in, uh, in doing that. And then we'll toss you out uh, into a breakout room so you can carry on some conversation. But thank you very much, Don. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, and thanks so much, Glenn, for uh, that excellent conversation, that excellent learning and, and insight that you were all able to share. We're uh, extremely grateful. So, um, some pieces that I'm going to remind and do wrap up on here. Uh, I will note again that we have a survey I'm putting into the chat that we are doing because uh, we have to collect, I mean, really we have to collect that data. Uh, and so that's the primary motivation for the survey. But from your perspective, it's also how we get your mailing address so we can send you the wonderful light box that we're putting together, uh, which we'll be sending out after the gathering uh, which will be uh, have a bunch of different items from different social enterprises. So please go into that uh, doc that I just put into the chat um, and make sure that you have completed that form. Um, a note, of course, at the end of this at the end of this week, you're going to get another survey that will be the evaluation survey for the whole week. So please uh, be ready for that, and we always helps us when you do those. Um, social media. If you are one of those who participates in, in social media, uh, please post about the gathering. It's helpful for us. We have the hashtag GAV2020. I'll put that into the chat. GAV spelt G-A-T-H and 2020 spelt 2020. Um, so please post about the event, post your, what you see on uh, photos and screenshots of the speakers and quotes and whatever you like. Our next session um, is COVID-19 and food security from emergency to equity. So that is starting at 11 a.m. So we'll be looking forward to that session. Um, right now though, I have the pleasure of introducing a, another artist uh, who will be performing for us today. Uh, Madeline Roger, a folk singer songwriter from Winnipeg here in Winnipeg in Canada. Madeline's critically acclaimed debut album, Cottonwood, combined the elegant storytelling of folk traditions with the grounded vibe of roots music. Madeline nominate, was nominated for both English Songwriter of the Year at the 2020 Canadian Folk Music Awards and Producer of the Year at the 2019 Western Canadian Music Awards. Madeline has toured extensively, oh, it's a list, across Canada and Europe, uh, worked with esteemed institutions such as the Winnipeg Folk Festival, Vancouver Island Music Festival, Stan Rogers Folk Festival, Summer Folk Festival of Arts and Crafts, the Newfoundland and Labrador, Labrador Folk Festival, the Calgary Folk Club, and of course Festival de Voyageur and others. So without any further ado, I look forward to hearing from Madeline as so many others in this country have uh, gotten to in the past. So thanks, Maddie. Thanks for that. Hi, everyone pretty uh, amazing to see all of your beautiful faces. Thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, here's a song about trees. century fell 
Put your fingers down into the earth Fed on water and sun Your boughs will bend To kiss the river's edge Sent your love down into the earth Fed on water and sun When you shed your skin It's winter again Dug your toes down into the earth Fed on water and sun When you take your stand Watch over this land giant elm tree started off small at the edge of a century stood your feet on top of the earth fed on water and sun when you drop your Another tree to feed. <laughs> I have to say it's uh it's super inspiring to see all of the amazing organizations that are represented here in this zoom meeting and and hearing a bit about all of the work that everybody's doing because i know it's um it's a tough time for so many people and so many organizations and it's just uh it's really really heartening to see how many people are still carrying on with the good work despite all of the challenges and the new hurdles and and um new systems that everybody has to learn so Thanks for doing what you do. I think I've forgotten that there's a bit of a world out there. <laughs> I haven't left my, my home much these days. Here's a new one.
Just gonna switch my guitar. <laughs> I had to lock my kitten out of my room. I don't know if anybody else got a uh, got a quarantine pet. I sure did, <laughs> because you all need to know her name is Cricket, and she's I think she's eleven weeks old right now, but um. 10 to 11 a.m. is her bananas time and she climbs my curtains so I had to lock her out of the room. Well, I guess I'll be seeing more of you throughout the day. This is so much fun. Thanks for having me. sorry i wanted to very quickly just say i wish brendan was here from a cinema and credit union because he's a bank and i bet you you look attractive to him just saying well, we are banking with the cinema and credit union yes so yes, we made only we could clone them yes exactly absolutely it's sorry, just... sorry. oh no no problem i was gonna say i completely hear your frustration so i'm uh, i'm also probably a pretty new face i'm a i'm a lawyer focusing on working with charities and nonprofits. And one of the things that's that's always hard for me is there's there's no legal definition of a social enterprise for for a charity or either a related or an unrelated business and nonprofits. Eight billion 
people here today with everyone a thing to say but who dig the ditch who sow the seam across the ocean not exactly what we mean you can't amend the things you said to me you can't have meant the things that you said to me i put it all behind me it's all coming up in front of me This is the luckiest This is the 